Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, FRPA 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Praise God. It's a joy and a privilege to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Brothers and sisters, I've been richly blessed this morning to just see how the Lord is instructing us, teaching us, unfolding the service. Thank you all for coming this morning. God bless you. May our hearts and our cups be turned up to the Lord. And as they are, He does give drink to those that are thirsty. Praise God. Open your Bibles to Revelation 12. Revelation 12 and verse 7 through verses 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who has accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Let's kneel together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do kneel before you, Lord. We bow our bodies, Lord. We prostrate ourselves before you, Lord. We bow our hearts, Lord. Our will. And Father, we just do invite you to please come and take your seat upon the throne of our hearts today. Father, thank you that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. 
Father, thank You that You are here, Lord. Father, I pray that today You would in mercy look upon us, Lord, and breathe upon us, O breath of God. Blow upon us, O wind of God. Lord, we need You, Father. I need You, Lord. All is vain unless Your Spirit comes. Father, this morning it is my sincere desire that my flesh wouldn't get in the way, that I could just be out of the way, Lord. I know, Lord, it's not by the tone of my voice or the raising of my voice or whatever, Lord. So, Father, I just pray, please, Lord, crucify all the earthly within me, Lord, that emptied of sin and self may I be and filled with the Spirit of God. Please, Lord, make Thy Word to be a fire in our midst. Make Thy Word to be a hammer in our midst. Make Thy Word to be a sharp two-edged sword in our midst. O oh, Father, make Thy Word to be a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart this morning, Lord. Oh, please, Lord, come, Father, and breathe upon this congregation, Lord. Father, give utterance and anointing to Your Word. Father, I, I think of Paul where he said that uh, it's not in, in man's wisdom, and he preaches not himself, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and Himself crucified. And so, Father, I come that way this morning. And I, I recognize, Lord, if anything good's going to come, Lord, it's because of You. It's because of Your Spirit, Lord. It's not because of me. So, Father, I plead with You this morning that You would look upon us in mercy. And, Father, that You would stamp Your hand, Your image, Your holy awe upon our hearts, Lord. Only You can do that, Lord. Father, I pray that you would bring a word of, that is in season, Lord, to every heart here, Father, and only you can do that, Lord. Some need comfort, Lord. Some need encouragement. Uh, maybe, maybe some need awakening, Lord, out of lethargy. Father, maybe some need a conviction of sin, Lord. So, Father, we plead with you in Jesus' name. Oh, God, tailor this, this, this word to, to our need, Father. Lord, we need You, Father. Father, I pray that, that, that I could just be out of the way, Lord. And that You can speak, Father. Lord, it's an awesome thing to stand in the pulpit of God. I don't want to speak my own words or my own ideas, but I want to preach the Word of God faithfully, earnestly, with zeal, with purpose, with longing, with anticipation, with faith, with hope. Oh, with loving kindness and tender mercies, Lord. Father, visit us today that we may know that you have met with us, God. You're here. Father, would you just now take your seat, Lord. We pray in Christ Jesus' name that every thought would be brought into the obedience and captivity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we wouldn't be distracted that all of our walls or all of our reasons would be cast down at the Word of God. And we'd say, yes, Lord. This we ask in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. I've written the title to the message this morning on the board, The Blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The verses we read here in Revelation 12, the text is verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. The blood of the Lamb. The word 
of their testimony. They loved not their lives. We heard on Wednesday evening that we're in a war. There's many strategies in the war. But there's one key to victory in the war. And that is the fact that Jesus Christ has prevailed and that He, by the blood of His cross, has prevailed. And we must, brothers and sisters, as regenerated, born-again Christians, hold fast to the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must never lose sight of the blood of the Lamb. We could go through our hymnal and we could find Dozens of hymns written about the merits of the blood of the Lamb. There's power in the blood to overcome sin. There's power in the blood to overcome the devil. There's power in the blood to overcome the flesh. There's power in the blood for whatever ails mankind in his sinfulness. There's power in the blood for murderers to be saved and forgiven. There's power in the blood that a man who would murder innocents could be forgiven. Now that is staggering. That a man could murder innocents and yet find forgiveness. But it's true, my brothers, my sisters, there's power in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. We have no other argument this morning, no other plea, but that Jesus' blood was shed and it was shed for me. Because but for the grace of God, there go I. A murderer, a drunkard, an adulterer, a fornicator, a liar, a thief, a robber, all of these things. Oh yes, and such were some of you and me, but we've been washed in the blood. That's our only hope. That's our only plea. That Jesus Christ's blood was shed, and it was shed for me. Oh, glory, the world needs to hear the message. The Muslim world needs to hear the message of God's love and His mercy. That He's a merciful God, forgiving iniquities and sins and transgressions. Oh, and the blood. We must never lose sight of it once we've been redeemed and washed. The blood of the Lamb. We overcome our foe. We overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb. That same blood that washed us from our sins when we were saved. My dear brother, Jonathan, you've been saved and washed in the blood. Hold fast the head of the Lord Jesus Christ and never lose sight of the efficacy of the cleansing, heaping power of the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. My brothers, my sisters, did you behold the Lamb of God yet today? Did you worship Him? Did you bow your heart to Him and give Him the reverence and the worship and the glory that is due to His name? Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, Lord Jesus. Thou art worthy to receive glory to receive praise, to receive honor and blessing and power and might and dominion. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. And at His, at His name, 
Every knee shall bow. Glory to Jesus. He's worthy. He's worthy. They overcame Him. We want to look at the they. We want to look at Him. And we want to look at some practical things. We're going to look at Him first. They overcame Him. Who's the Him? They overcame that great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, they overcame him, Brother Luke. I'm so blessed with the opening this morning. They overcame him. I have a lot of scriptures. I'll try to remember to give you the reference, but I would recommend you just listen. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, the devil. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5, 8, Job 1, 6 and 7. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The devil is still in his same profession. He's walking up and down in the earth and He's seeking whom He may devour. He is our enemy. Matthew 13, 39. The enemy of our souls. He's the one that sowed this evil seed and wicked seed in the harvest. And He says, the enemy that sowed this wicked seed is the devil. The devil is sowing wicked seed today. He's sowing wicked seed, evil seed, with to deception and to destroy. The devil, he is a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in the truth. He rebelled against God, we know. He is a liar. And he's the father of it. John 8, 44. The devil is a liar. That old devil is serpent, is a serpent, and he is subtle. In Genesis it tells us that the serpent was more subtle, meaning he was more crafty. And he worked in craftiness to deceive. Paul, speaking to the Corinthian church, said, I would to God ye bear with me in my folly. I am jealous over you for a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Oh yeah, that old subtle devil was still at work in Paul's day. And he said, I fear for you. Lest that same subtlety and deceptiveness by which Satan deceived Eve, he'll deceive you and lead you astray from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he cometh and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit whom ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Paul said, at one place I tell you, weeping, that there are many false Christs gone out into the world. They overcame him. The devil. They overcame him. Time doesn't permit me to give you the whole context of this next one. 2 Corinthians 11, 12-15 but what I do, I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, wherein they glory that they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works." 
Now, brothers and sisters, this right here, what I just shared from the Scriptures out of 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15, I believe is what we are facing in our day as a flood of iniquity and unrighteousness upon our nation and upon the nations that are prosperous nations and where there is freedom of religion and they say, you just worship God however you want and then the devil transforms himself and he comes in as an angel of light. And his ministers are transformed as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So, brothers and sisters, we must know the Word of God. And we must know our God. Because if we don't know the Word of God and don't know our God, we are susceptible to deception. Because these ministers pose as ministers of righteousness. And the devil himself transforms himself into an angel of light. I have at times wondered when you could not get a clear testimony out of a living soul of being born again and regenerated and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but when they were dying, they saw a light. And all the family members said, Oh, it's beautiful. He saw the light. I'm not too sure. Keeping people under bondage keeping people under false security that if I just go to church and dress right and do right and commune and all of this, then I'm right with God. But never a testimony of, oh, I'm a wretched, rotten sinner that needs a Savior. Never a testimony of saying, I was lost in sin, but Jesus saved my soul. Never that kind of a testimony can you get out of their lives while they're alive. But when they're on their deathbed, they see a light. And they say, oh, I see a light. And the family members rejoice because they take comfort. Be careful. They overcame Him. That deceitful worker posing himself as being an apostle of Christ They knew the Word of God and they searched Him out and they saw and proved by the Word of God that He was false. May we have that discernment in our day. Brothers and sisters, we must have that discernment in our day. And it's not judging. It's not judging to have discernment in our day. People will say, oh, but you're judging. You're judging these people. We better have some righteous discernment. And have some righteous judgment. The Bible says so. Because we live in a day when there is a flood of religious materials and goods spread out across the land. How many books do you need on how to overcome sin? I'll tell you, this is the book you need. And a broken and a contrite and honest heart. And I'm not saying there isn't some books out there that can be a benefit. But hear me this morning. This is the book you need. For it's the Word of God. And it's quick and it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Be careful. Beware of the psychology that looks back and blames everything on your childhood. That's why you are the way you are. Beware! Beware! Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from sin and sets free and delivers. Yeah, now if there's things back there in your childhood that you haven't repented of and it's a hook in your life, you may need to deal with it. Amen! Deal with it! But don't take 20 years to wallow around and go from one counselor to the next. And just not keep getting victory. Sometimes the answer is as clear as the hand before your face. Him. They overcame Him. The tempter. The tempter came to Jesus. And He said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Let's see some proof that you're a Christian. Why don't you work a miracle for me?
Beware. They overcame him. He's the tempter. He's the God of this world. The God of this world has blinded their minds, it says in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. He's blinded their eyes which believe not, lest they should believe. The glorious gospel and the light of the gospel should shine in their hearts. He's the God of this world. He's the wicked one. He is wicked. The devil is wicked. He is evil. And when one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catches away that which is sown in his heart. Matthew thirteen nineteen, and in Matthew thirteen thirty eight thirty nine, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. They're his agents. They're his cohorts. Seducing men and women into sin and compromise. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou saidest in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the height of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Isaiah fourteen twelve through 15 and Revelation 19, verse 19 and 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the, into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Oh. They overcame him. And Revelation 19 says, And I heard a great multitude rejoicing in heaven. And they were rejoicing in the, their God because the devil, that old deceiver, that liar was cast down into the lake of fire. Hallelujah! Him. That's the end of him. He is full of pride. I will exalt myself. I will be like God. Oh, but they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb. We want to look at the blood. The blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah for the blood. Hallelujah for a sin-cleansing fountain. Hallelujah for the blood. Praise the Lord. Jesus Christ established the New Testament in His own blood. Very clearly it is written in Matthew 26, He took the cup and gave thanks and said unto them all, Drink ye of it, this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for the remission of sins. Through the blood, the New Testament, the New Covenant is established. Through the blood, we are purchased in in Acts chapter 20 verse 28. He says there that we're to feed the flock of God, the overseers, the elders, which He has purchased with His own blood. Oh, the blood of the Lamb. God commanded His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. We are justified through His blood. Justified, just as if we'd have never sinned. Hallelujah! The blood of bulls and goats can't do that. 
But the blood of Christ, it justifies, it saves. Ephesians 1, 6 and 7, We're to the praise of His glory and His grace, where He has made us accepted in the Beloved. Oh, glory, accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Oh, the blood of Jesus grants us forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Forgiveness of sins. Ah, forgiven. Ah, the weight is rolled off. Forgiven. All of my sins washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah for the blood. The blood of Christ. brings us to a place of peace with God. Having made peace through the blood of His cross, brings reconciliation by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works, yet now has He reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Through the blood. Chalmers was his name. Can't tell you his first name. Late 1800s over in Papua New Guinea, preaching the gospel to those headhunters, those cannibals. And these tribes, they hated each other and they schemed for when they could plot another murder and kill somebody and eat them. Oh, but Chalmers, he wasn't afraid. He knew his God. He didn't love his life unto death. He loved the Lord Jesus with all his heart. He knew the power of the gospel. And he walked in amongst those headhunters. And he preached the Lord Jesus Christ unto them. And they got saved and got converted. Then he preached to the other tribe. And they got saved and they got converted. Oh, hallelujah. Not long later, they were all sitting together, having sweet fellowship and communion around the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the blood of His cross, the two tribes that were enemies and ate each other were brought nigh. And they were made one in the the body of the Lord Jesus Christ through His cross. Oh, glory to God. I've been so blessed reading of Chalmers. 1870s or so. Over in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, finally they did eat him. But his life goes on and testifies of the saving grace and power of God. And those that ate Him are serving Christ today. Praise the Lord for the power of the blood of the Lamb to change people's lives. The blood. I think I'll go on. There's a lot more I have on the blood. I'll share a few more. Ye know, brothers and sisters, ye know. But let me stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. That ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Oh no, it takes a lot more than tradition passed down. Now I'm thankful for good tradition. And I don't want to speak evil of good tradition. The Bible does say, hold fast to the traditions which you have received of us. Nothing wrong with traditions. Oh, but the traditions cannot save us. Remember, it's the blood of Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, that redeems us and saves us. With the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's how we've been redeemed, brothers and sisters. That's how we overcome. 1 John 1, 7, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 1, 5, Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, and his Father. To him be glory and dominion 
forever. And if that were not enough, and ever, and we could just continue, and ever, unto Him be glory, majesty, power, might, and dominion, forever, and ever, and ever, unto the Lamb of God, who loved us, and washed us from our sins in His own blood. Hallelujah. They sung a new song, Revelation 5, 9. Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nations. They overcame Him. Oh, glory to God. They. Who are the they? We could spend weeks talking about the they. And we could open it up for testimonies talking about the they who overcame by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame that wicked one. They overcame that deceiver. They overcame that old devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. They. Let's look for these marks in these men and women. Daniel. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. Oh, I like the testimony of Daniel. He's one of those they that overcame. Daniel, a young man, exiled out of his country into a strange place, away from all his human authorities. Oh, but God was with him. And he had that conscious knowledge of the presence of the Holy God with him. So he wouldn't defile himself with the king's meat. It was no time to live it up for Daniel in a strange city where his elders can't see him and his mom and dad can't see him. Oh, but this was a time to prove the grace and power of God and the power of the blood of the Lamb to overcome. And Daniel, he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. You know, Daniel was faithful in little things. And when the big test came, he stood. Glory to God! I'm blessed this morning. Young men, young women, you who are faithful in little things, oh, when the bigger test comes, you'll be faithful in those things also. Look at Daniel. They tried to find fault with him. They tried to find occasion against him. But they couldn't find any fault or occasion with him for as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Daniel 6 verse 4. So they connived. We're going to work this Daniel out of the way. We don't like him. He's always praying. He's so righteous. Self-righteous Daniel. He's so holy. What can we do to get this Daniel out of our face? His life is so convicting. Oh, we know what we'll do. We'll go to the king. And we'll flatter the king. We'll convince the king... That anybody who prays to any other God or asks any petition from anyone else besides the king should be thrown into the lion's den. Ah, they were rubbing their hands with glee. The king signed the decree. It worked. And the Bible says, Daniel 6, verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. His windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled down upon his knees. Ah, ha, no compromise for Daniel. Daniel, you could at least just stay standing. No. He kneeled upon his knees there three times a day. Well, Daniel, why don't you just say your prayers while you're still in your bed? You know, compromise a little bit here. Daniel, you're alive. You know what they said. But no, he prayed and he gave thanks before his God as he did before. I mean, look how Daniel, he was so full of joy and the thanksgiving of God abounding in his heart. He just knelt down and prayed just like he did before. Oh, glory to Jesus for young men and women who are like Daniel in our midst. Praise God. 
They're not ashamed to bear the testimony of Jesus. They're not ashamed to pray over lunch break at times or whatever the, whatever the hour is. They're not ashamed to be seen driving down the road in their car talking. And the other person says, well, who's he talking to? There's nobody in the car. But yes, there is. God is with me and I can pray without ceasing while I'm driving down the road in my car. Praise the Lord. So they threw Daniel in the lion's den. Yeah, they did. God left him go right down in there into the den. Oh, but he showed himself mighty. Those who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And the Lord shut the mouth of the lions that they did no hurt to Daniel. Ah, oh, the king couldn't sleep. He was wringing his hands and he was up all night and he couldn't wait till morning to go see if God spared Daniel. And he cried with a lamentable voice, Oh, Daniel! Ah. When he heard Daniel's voice and he knew that God had delivered him. What a testimony! What a testimony! And what a testimony God wants to wrought in your life as you are faithful to God in the little things. And as the bigger tests come and you're faithful in them, God will stand up for His children. He'll not forsake them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, I love this. Oh, I love it. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame that old devil. They overcame all of the obstacles because they trusted God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is also found in Daniel chapter 3. That proud Nebuchadnezzar, whom we heard about this morning, ah, set up a big grave and image unto himself. Everybody needs to bow down and worship this image. And in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake unto these three, and he said, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? So he gave him another chance. He said, Alright, I'll tell you what. We'll go around one more time. You're just young men, ignorant, devoid of true understanding. We'll give you another chance. We'll play the music again and when it comes around again and you bow, then everything will be okay. But if not, we've got a hot, fiery furnace and we're going to throw you in there. And who's going to deliver you out of the furnace or out of my hand? Oh, that's where he made a mistake. Because God delights to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. You know, they didn't compromise. They said, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fairy furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king. We will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There is no compromise. A fairy furnace? Sorry, king. You know, see, that's exactly what it was with Chalmers. As he ministered to those headhunters, and he knew God was with him, he wasn't afraid to die, because to die is gain. So these headhunters, they'd follow him sometimes right behind him with their big iron, I mean, their big uh, stone handled uh, hammers and clubs raised up, and he knew one blow, and I'll be with my Lord Jesus. But the blow didn't come, because they saw life in this man. They saw peace. No fear of dying. He wasn't afraid of them. Pretty hard to kill somebody like that. Because death has no power over him. Everybody else they killed, terror in their eyes, fleeing for their lives. But Chalmers, no, he just keeps walking with his God. One time they made it all out. They arranged the whole thing between two tribes. We're going to, we know that Chalmers is going to come here on this trail to go to his boat. He has to walk about two miles, and his boat is down there by the river. And about 
a mile before the river, they congregated. And when Chalmers came walking, they rushed him. We're going to get him. They had all decided this one tribe would take so many of his possessions and so many of these things. And uh, they'd all sit together and have a great feast eating him. And his uh, translator who was walking with him, one of the natives from another tribe not too far gone by, when he saw them rushing him, he said, let's kneel and pray. But Chalmers had a word from the Lord, no, let's walk and pray. And so they kept walking and praying. And they didn't look back. And these natives were all behind them, right, right upon them. But the blow never came. They made it down to their boat and, and they left. Because there was no fear of dying. Because to die is to go to be with my Lord. And I believe that's what was in these young men. They knew their God. And there was no fear of the fiery furnace. Because they knew their God. Well, we know they cast him in the fiery furnace. The fire was so hot that the men were slain who threw him in. But oh, our miracle working God, the greater the extreme of the test, the greater the glory of the deliverance. So God made sure there was enough evidence there that the furnace was indeed hot. The men that threw him in, they were slain. But Nebuchadnezzar was watching. He said, did you not catch just three men in there? I see four men walking loose, unhurt, walking in there in the midst of the fire. And he was astonished. So he called them out. He said, the fourth is like the Son of God. The light was beginning to dawn on him. He removed them from the furnace. And listen what it says. They all gathered together. Can you imagine that curious crowd? They were all there, you know. All having to come to worship this image. So God set this whole thing up to get much glory to His name. All the people are together. It says they were there being gathered together. The princes, the governors, the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men. What a testimony for the glory of God! Ah, they saw him, and it says, upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. Praise God. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives. King, be it known, you throw us in the furnace, we die in there, no big deal. They love not their lives. And the word of their testimony, they were willing to testify and stand for what they believed. They were men of conviction. They weren't wimpy. They, Joseph, we have to look at Joseph. Joseph, a young man, full of zeal for the Lord. And God gave him a dream. Joseph, someday your brothers are going to bow down to you. He had the dream of the sheaves bowing and Joseph, a young man full of zeal and vigor for the Lord, shared his dream with his brothers. They didn't like it. They read into the dream. Oh, you think someday you're going to be over us and we're going to serve you? Joseph, maybe a little unwise there, full of zeal, fur, you know, and he shares his dream because he's all excited for the Lord. And so it looks like it goes downhill from there. And I share this this morning just to encourage our hearts. You have dreams for God. You have visions for God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Dream on. Dream on. When the Spirit of the Lord is, cast, is uh, poured out, oh, they shall dream dreams and they shall see visions. The Bible says, dream on. Yes. But the Lord had a fire for Joseph to go through. He went out to his brethren 
they didn't like him. They hated him. So they stripped him of his coat and they cast him into a pit. And they sold him to a bunch of Ishmaelites going down to Egypt. Pretty hard test. But Lord, the dream. What is this? A servant in Potiphar's house. But the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered him. Oh, now, Lord, you're going to bring to pass my dream. Not yet, Joseph. Not so fast. There's still more of God's school for you to go through. Joseph, you're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. His master's wife cast her eye on him. Joseph, lie with me. But he refused. And he refused. And the Bible says that he knew his God and he said, How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He wasn't going to use the excuse, well, she made me do it. No, not Joseph. He knew his God. This intensified verse 10 of Genesis 39, and she spake to Joseph day by day, trying to wear him down. Day by day. Day after day. Oh. I'm sure Joseph's heart was grieving and he was vexed. And he wanted out of there. But the Bible says he hearkened not unto her. Even to be with her. He gave no room. I believe his Righteous, godly heart, he avoided this woman because he saw she was an agent of the devil to try to destroy him and bring him down and destroy all of God's beautiful plans for his life and fulfill all those dreams that he's been dreaming for God. So he didn't give any room to be with her in her presence. But one day he had to go in the house to do some business. Genesis 39 verse 11. And she caught him. Probably hid or snuck up on him and caught him by the garment. But Joseph, bless God, he fled and he left his garment. But then she put out a false report. And her husband believed her. Partially. I don't think he believed her fully. Or he'd have had Joseph killed. But God was in the midst of all of this. So Joseph was thrown into prison. And again, Joseph could say, But Lord, what about the dream? What about the plans for my life? Oh, young man. Young woman, whoever you are this morning, don't lose sight of the visions for God in your heart as you go through the fires and the testings and you find yourself in a prison. Ah, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. There was two men in the prison who had a dream, a butler and... Let's see, the butler and the uh, baker had a dream and Joseph interpreted the dream and it came true just like Joseph said. And so, the butler, he got set free from prison. He was back squeezing the juice for Pharaoh and the baker, he was hung. And then, Pharaoh had a dream. 
All the wise men, all the astrologers, all the magicians, they couldn't interpret the dream. And then Genesis 41 verse 9, the chief butler spake unto Pharaoh, said, Oh, I do remember my fault this day. All this while Joseph was in the prison. I believe it's two years. I think that's what about figures out too, as I recall. He said, I remember my fault this day. And so they brought Joseph quickly. Oh, they sent for him and brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself. He changed his raiment and he came unto Pharaoh. And we know that he had the wisdom of God to interpret the dream. And God raised him up. Pharaoh said, For as much as God has showed you all these things, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house. And according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And of course, it's a long story. be a whole sermon in itself. But in the end, as Joseph was sharing with his brethren, he said, You know, you meant it for evil when you cast me in that pit. But God meant it for good. My dear brothers and sisters, all things work together for good to those who love God. No devil, no demon can derail God's plan. Do you believe it? No one else but myself can derail God's plan for my life. All things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called, the called according to His purpose. Oh, praise the Lord. And Joseph knew that. They, well, time does fail me, as the Scriptures say in Hebrews, to tell you about all the rest. Noah moved with fear, a righteous man, built an ark to the saving of his house, Abraham, he obeyed God when he heard His voice and he went. Will you go? Sarah, hallelujah, Sarah, when she was old, received strength to conceive seed and be delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged Him faithful who had promised. Hallelujah. Moses, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Oh, hallelujah, he had some dreams and he had some visions. He saw him who is invisible. He didn't live for the here and now. Just stop and look at the flood of the devil's flood upon the societies of prosperous nations. Have it now. You owe it to yourself. No credit, no problem. Buy now, pay later. Indulge. Everything to gratify the senses and the flesh. I don't know if we have as much today as Egypt had in that day or not, but I believe Egypt was pretty high up the ladder as far as on the scale of prosperity and having everything at their fingertips. Moses could have had all those things right at his fingertips. Oh, but he saw beyond. He saw Him who is invisible. He saw the living God. Rahab. Oh, I like this one. Rahab? Yes, Rahab. She overcame. Rahab overcame. Reason I like this one, there's been many reasons, but you know, she didn't have a very good upbringing. She didn't have a good solid heritage behind her. In fact, her present situation was not very Well, then the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11.31 that by faith, Rahab. But you know, it says something else first. It says, by faith, the harlot, Rahab. Yes, 
You can be changed and washed in the blood. And such were some of ye, but ye are washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye are cleansed and sanctified. Rahab. What shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, of Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and of the prophets. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And they love not their lives. Just a few practical things. This morning, Luke 14. I want you to turn there with me now. Turn to Luke chapter 14. And let's stand together to read this scripture unless you have a sleeping baby and can't stand. Luke 14. And verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Verse 27. For whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You may be seated. They love not their lives. <clears throat> you know, I don't want to just leave it up there with Chalmers over there in Papua New Guinea. Praise God for the faithful martyrs. But you know what? We can die right here and not love our lives. The Bible says, The Lord Jesus Christ in John 10, He said, As the Father has known Me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down My life for the sheep. Jesus laid down His life for the sheep. Other sheep have I, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring. They shall hear My voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth My Father love Me, because I lay down My life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Jesus laid down His life a voluntary sacrifice and offering. No, they didn't come and take Him by force in the garden. No, they didn't take and kill Him by by their force and bring Him captive. Jesus laid down His life. And this honor and privilege have you and I to lay down our lives, just like Jesus did. John 15, Jesus said these words in verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now we can say, okay, so if somebody comes in here with a gun and starts shooting, I'll jump in front of my wife or my brother and I'll take the hit. And I'll lay down my life. Amen. I think that's right. But you know, if we just keep it way up there, how are we going to get it practical in our lives today where we live? Brothers and sisters, I believe there is a very real practical application for us today. 1 John three sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. Yes, we just read it. There we perceive love. True love lays down His life. And He finishes by saying, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Whoso has this world's good, see if his brother have need, shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Am I willing to lay down my life for the Lord Jesus Christ? We say yes.
Yes, I'll lay down my life for the Lord Jesus Christ. He laid down His life for me. But where the test really comes, am I willing to lay down my life for the brethren? Or does it have to be my way or the highway? I, I, me, why? You know, it is a test of our Christian character and our brokenness and our humility whether we are able to submit ourselves under the hand of God and submit ourselves one to another and lay down our lives for the brethren. It's love that does that. No rule can do it. I can't stand up here this morning and give you a ten-point list that now you can lay down your life for your brother and tell you how you ought to. No, I, I can't do that. But the love of Christ in our hearts It'll do that. He that saith, I love God. Oh yes, I'll lay my life down for God. But he shutteth up his bowels of compassion to his brother's need. How dwelleth the love of God in him? How? It's pretty easy to get a few jars out of the basement and take some food when somebody needs food. But what about a spiritual need? What about a hurting heart? What about a fault in my life? Can I lay down my life and my reputation to go to my sister, my brother, Can you lay down your life, your reputation, to come to me? What if they don't receive it? Oh, see, there's the issue, right? They love not their lives. See, there lies the issue. This has been the issue for generations. Jesus said, I would that they would be one. Even as I and the Father are one. But he tells us how it is. It's through love. I love my Father. I obey my Father. My Father loves me. Here is the love of God manifest. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it's just a beautiful love relationship. But when I love myself, how dare you come to me? You have some needs in your own life. And so we're afraid. And we're afraid of our reputation. Oh, but they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And I believe we can overcome that fear of my life, my reputation, and what people would say or think about me. We can overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives by sacrificing. Paul said, I become servant to all, though I am free. To the weak I become as weak. To the Jew is to the Jew. To the Gentile is to the Gentile. To those without law is without law. Oh, but quickly hasten to say, not without law to God or to Christ. No, it's not just to do as you please. No, it's a death to self so that I might win some to Christ. And that same death to self 
and laying down our lives for the brethren will yield a beautiful fruit. And I want to bless God this morning. And I want to bless the Lord and thank God for the body here at Charity. I have seen you brothers and sisters lay down your life. And I thank God for that. God bless you. Thank you. Let us press on and continue growing in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the love of God and the love of the brethren and the sisters. God bless each one of you. I love you and I didn't desire this message to be a, a burden or a hard thing, but to just be free to preach what the Lord laid on my heart this morning. Can we kneel together in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank You for the blood of the Lamb. Oh Lord, we have this confidence, Father, that as it says there in 1 John, He says, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have overcome that wicked one. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome that wicked one. Oh, Father, this morning I pray, let there be faith arise in our hearts, Lord. And looking unto Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, and be overcoming as we place our faith and confidence in Him. Oh, Lord, it's not by just pulling myself up, Lord. And it's not by just trying harder. But Lord, it's looking unto Christ Jesus, holding fast to the head and denying myself, not loving my life. And by the word of the testimony and the blood of the Lamb, they overcame that old devil, that old liar. Oh, Father, give us a quick discerning sensitivity to Your Spirit and to Your voice. Father, You tell us, Lord Jesus, that Your sheep, they know Your voice, and a stranger they'll not hear. Give us that discernment, Lord. Let none of us be playing into the hands of the enemy at all, Lord, and uh, spreading gossip or rumor or speaking evil one of another. Any such thing, Lord, be it far from us. Cleanse us, wash us, Lord, and let fervent love for Jesus and for one another and for the love of the brethren be our mark here at Charity Christian Fellowship. Oh, Father, do Your beautiful work of Your Spirit in our hearts. Thank You for what You're doing and what You have done. And Father, we have this confidence that the God who has begun a good work in You, He will perform it until the day of Christ. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Appreciate it so much, Brother Aaron, how you brought in the... Uh, Hebrews 11, that by faith these men overcame. And, you know, it's as we, as we have faith, as we walk in faith in the blood of Christ, as we walk in faith, that though our lives are taken, we can, um, you know, we can enter heaven's gate and, and do not have to have any fear. It's by faith, and I just so appreciated the message. I... <clears throat> I'm also I'm reminded of 1 John, it says, um, 1 John, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is a victory that overcome, overcometh the world, even our faith. And I just encourage us this morning, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, expected for. That when we put our faith in the blood of Christ, and when we speak forth the word of our testimony, we are, we are walking in faith. You know, it takes faith to believe that, that Christ can overcome sin in me and through me. And, um, and then uh, it says, it, see, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, when we are going through a battle, <clears throat> Satan may be tempting us. We can rest assured that faith in the blood of the Lamb will overcome. Despite, it's the evidence of things not seen. In other, in other words, we can believe by faith that I will overcome even though the wind, winds are blowing, the tempest is raging. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. As we put our faith in the blood of Christ and, bring, and by faith bring forth the word of our testimony. And by faith, not love our lives even unto the death. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that uh, message.
Okay. Is there someone who would like to share? Get your hands up and and uh, share what uh, the Lord is doing in your life or a word of testimony. I really appreciated the message, and I'd like to just draw attention to uh, the blood of the Lamb. I remember as a young Christian, and even before that, wondering what it is about the blood. What is it? There's so much made of the blood. And I'd like to just uh, maybe quote a, a scripture or two here. The Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God by faith. And that blood represents the sin offering. It represents the, the, the Christ was, was a sinless sacrifice. And uh, just in the Old Testament, where the, before the sacrifice was slain, you know, they would place their hand upon the head and confess their sin. And that innocent animal then gave its life. Jesus became the fulfillment of that in that He was able to bear our sins. He that knew no sin became a sin offering for us that we might become the righteousness of God by faith. And how that works in a practical way then is whenever the accuser that we heard about here this morning, when he comes to me and he reminds me of all my inadequacies and my inabilities and the sins and the imperfections that are yet there, I by faith can point him to the perfection Amen. of the Lamb of God. Amen. I can say, look at Jesus. And I, I tell him sometimes, thank you. I, I need another reminder about how much I need my Jesus. Amen. You know, my brothers and my sisters, and they remind me, but my enemy also reminds me that I need Jesus. And at that moment, when I confess, give testimony to the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus, he loses his power. It's not because of any merit of my own, but I stand upon the merit. The, Isaiah 53 says, And he, or God, shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. And that atonement, that payment, the, the perfectness of the blood of Jesus made him a fitting a sacrifice for my sin, the Lamb of God. Praise His name. That's beautiful, Brother Daniel. Amen. How we can point to the blood of the Lamb when He tries to bring back our sins and remind us of them and tries to discourage us with our past. The blood of the Lamb. That's how, that's how we overcome. Brother Paul, or I'm sorry, Brother Jeremy in the back, go ahead. I was tremendously inspired and challenged this morning, Brother Aaron. Thank you so much for sharing that. It was exactly what I needed. God is so faithful in giving us what we need. Um, my heart was just overwhelmed almost with once again being reminded that Jesus Christ is all that we need to be accepted perfectly into the Beloved. And... I, I, you know, one of my favorite verses is Romans chapter 5, verse 1, which says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the blood. It is the blood of Christ that so many times gives me the victory over sin, gives me a weapon to fight against a lot of the, uh, the assaults of the enemy against us. The blood of Jesus Christ. My very foundation, I find myself, I had to do it this morning again. I got up and you know, I, I felt myself just not feeling adequate, not feeling like I'm measuring up to what God wants me to be and got down on my knees and, Lord, just give my heart to the Lord once again and, fa and fell upon that foundation of Christ and the blood. And therein we, I find my identity. I'm a Christian. I am a blood-washed saint. I'm accepted perfectly of God because of the blood of Christ. Very precious to me. And then, Brother Aaron, you also said um, that we need to be judging. Or, you know, there are people out there that say, oh, don't judge. Don't judge here. Don't be careful how you approach this. Or, you know, the, the Bible does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2.15, it says the spiritual judges all things. 
He that is spiritual judges all things. He can discern because he sees things through the eyes of God. Thank you, Jeremy. Amen. Brother Paul. Others, get your hands up. I thank God for his word today. And um, appreciate how Aaron brought out there at the end about overcoming Satan uh, in our lives. We all have an enemy that wants to use our blind spots and our weaknesses to defeat us. And God in his love has put us in a body. A whole lot of people who can see those blind spots. You can see those areas that we have need of. And one of his purposes for us is that as I see a need in my brother. First of all, of course, that I have a burden and a prayer and a, uh, a burden for that brother. But then sometimes God wants me to go to talk to him. And uh, that is a laying down of my life. Amen. As it says there on the bottom, they love not their lives. It's a laying down of my life. And I think that's one that we probably struggle with the most. Is to go to talk to a brother when they have a need. Because we, we love our brothers and we don't want them to be estranged from us. And, and I think, too, it's hard to have a right attitude in that also, though. It takes a lot of prayer. It takes a, a burden. So we lay down our life. And then if our brother will lay down his life and see what God has to say to him through that, then the blood of the Lamb will cleanse us. Amen. And Satan will be defeated. Amen. I just appreciated seeing how that works together there. Amen. Also, uh, concerning Luke's message, I thought of uh, another testimony there. This is a pretty sober one, we had the young man here who shot his girlfriend's parents last year, the homeschool boy. Mm -hmm. He was a, uh, someone that I had worked for, his parents, and uh, they, were, they were homeschooling him. They're Christians who love the Lord. They had visions for their son to grow up and be a godly man. That boy used to pray. His dad told me he used to pray for us when we moved into Lancaster City. At night time, he'd pray for us that God would keep us safe. And as he grew up, he made some choices. And uh, I know a man who knows him well. He, he, he knows when the demons entered him playing video games. Mm -hmm. He actually confessed that to somebody. I remember when it happened. He was playing video games, killing games and things like that. And he, he knew when the demons came into his being. It's not a little thing. And, you know, sometimes I think homeschool Christian young people, they look at other youth who can, who can do certain things and get away with it, it seems like. And you can't get away with it. His testimony in jail was that he said, I can't believe how fast sin took me where it took me. He was shocked how quickly he went down. The reason being, he, he sinned against a greater light. He'd heard the word. He heard the truth. And for all of our children, you've heard the truth too. You may see others do things like that, play a video game or whatever it might be, and think, well, it's, it's really not that bad. But when you turn your back on the Lord and on the truth that you know, it takes you down farther and faster than you ever thought and ever wanted to go. So I just wanted to give that sober warning there. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. I, I'm reminded of a neighbor boy we also have who... I remember him saying in, in his childhood, maybe six to eight years old, he says, he said to me, you know, I'm, I'm praying for your dad's salvation. My dad is Amish, and I don't believe he's yet saved. But you know, that very young man is living in sin today. It's just amazing how sin can just take a person down a wrong road. And He moved out of his parents' home, and he's out living in sin. Christian family at that. Yeah. Christian father and mother. Same, basically the same thing, except he hasn't entered the depth of sin that this young man did but uh, any others Tim 
Well, I can say amen to them, both messages this morning as well. I was blessed to be here. I had to think, as <clears throat> Brother Amber's preaching, I don't know if he mentioned it or not, but it did occur to me the phrase where the Apostle says, As ye have received Christ, so walk ye in him. And I just pondered a bit, what did it take for me to receive Christ? It took a turning from my own way, a willful walk of 20 years in my own life of choosing my own way. For me to receive Christ, it meant to turn from that. So walk ye in him, he says. If we're going to continue in Christ, it means a staying away from our own way. Amen. I think of that. And something else Brother Aaron mentioned early on that really is struck a chord in my heart is something I've often thought of in regards to the book that we need. I'd like to read a little bit out of Ecclesiastes in the last chapter, chapter 12, starting at uh, verse 12. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Actually, verse 11, the words of the wise are like goes and the words of a scholar of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. And further, my son, be admonished by these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, hear God, and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether it is good or whether it is evil. I just had to think of that, you know, and as Brother Paul was talking about the video games and stuff. There's a lot of books out today, as well as tapes, and you name it, that are done in the name of Christ, you might say. Some are good, many are not. And the danger in that is that in the reading of these books and in the listening to these tapes and such like, we are at risk of interpreting the word of God by those rather than the other way around. So I just give that for what it's worth. Praise the Lord for the message. It's good, Tim. Thank you for that word there. Go ahead, Robert. Yes, I'd like to thank the Lord for uh, being alive. I'd like to thank the Lord for what he's put me through in the last 60 days. And I just thank to thank the Lord that how he talks to me and how I can turn to him every day and how I can turn to brothers and sisters that love me and I don't know how to say this in words that uh, Jesus is everything if he's not everything to you then you're not connected with Jesus and I don't mean that to hurt people's feelings or to think I'm better than anybody else but I know that Jesus died for me and I don't know if I knew it 60 days ago, but I know it now. And I know I can't get enough of Jesus. But what I do get enough of Jesus is, is his mercy, his love, his compassion. He's real. His foundation. Even having a discussion with my brother that he doesn't want to talk about religion or Christianity. But by God's wisdom, I will talk to my brother. Because someday my brother will come to Jesus. Because I want to spend an eternity in heaven with my brother. Not only with my brother, but other people. That God has created. He's created everybody. He created us for a reason. And I don't know if we'll ever know the reason, but God will show us the reason if we have a heart to be open and a heart to surrender and a heart to give up and a heart to stay out of our flesh. And a heart to stay away from Satan. And I just want to thank Aaron and I want to thank Luke for the sermon. I want to thank everybody that's connected with Jesus Christ because... What we have is real. And what we have is we can have more of it. So thank you very much for letting me be a servant. And thank you very much for letting me be here today. Thank you, Robert. Just reminded of, you know, Brother Luke, you started with, um, I think, verse 15 of chapter 1. And Paul says, just to remind us again, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by, live by faith. 
Then it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And Brother Robert, I just appreciated that thought. You know, he has a deep burden for his brother and he wants to preach the gospel to him and to whoever he meets was his words. And let us be that. Let, let us remind ourselves with the, the message that Luke shared that God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. There is no chance for a soul to enter into eternity in heaven to be with our Lord without repentance and coming to faith in the blood of Christ. God bless you, Robert, for sharing the gospel with your brother and having that heart of love for sinful humanity. Is there others yet? Up, up front here, quickly. Over to the side here. I just want to thank the Lord for saving my soul. And I just want to confess that sometimes by the walk of my life, I'm ashamed of him. And I know that that reflects um, something that I think the enemy has often wanted me to to make me feel like I don't have a testimony and to weaken that desire to actually witness for Jesus. And um, I just, I know that, that the Lord has saved me and I thank the Lord that we have victory through the blood of Jesus and that we don't have to stand on our own reasoning or feelings, but that we can safely trust in the blood of the Lamb and in the witness of the Holy Spirit that he puts into each of his children that love him. And I thank God that I do love him and I desire to walk with God and to see others walk with God. And I know that God knows my heart. And so when the enemy wants to come and accuse me, I have something to point him to and that is the blood of Jesus. And if I stand by faith and open my mouth, the Bible says that he will fill it. And I just thank the Lord and um, also thank him even for this morning. Last night I had two very just wicked dreams and they were not nice and they were just bizarre. And I just thank the Lord that that he just had such a calm over me. And I, I was just singing and I just was making praises that were coming from the fountain within and it just, as I was sitting here, it just so blessed me to realize that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know that the enemy wanted to use those dreams to um, cause me to worry or to fear or to be accused of the enemy. But I thank God that unconsciously almost he just welled up that fountain within me and it, the praises to God were just coming out naturally to him. And I, I thank the Lord that even sometimes when we don't really realize what is going on, he's overcoming for us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Barb. Other sisters. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Jeff. I just wanted to thank the Lord this morning for the wisdom, um, as Brother Aaron shared, keeping it from being way up there with Chalmers and bringing it down to Amen. overcoming in some of our daily challenges. That really ministered to me. It was a good reminder. Mm-hmm. You know, I think back to about just about 20 years ago, as a young single Christian, I, I had an opportunity to smuggle Bibles into China. And we were caught. And I remember thinking, okay, this is it. Um, I'm prepared to die. Um, God had mercy. That wasn't the outcome. But I remember almost a letdown after that, coming back to the normalcy of, of life in the States. And, and I really questioned, in the, the thrill and the excitement of that ministry, how much of an overcomer I really was. I appreciated how Brother Aaron brought out the fact that we die daily. There are many little challenges in our life. You add those up day after day. It's that faithfulness in the little things. I think of my my little little one that I am raising right now, and, and she's in a, a difficult season, just persisting. Last night, 
was a change in time. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get an extra hour of sleep. Well, she had other plans at about <laughs> bedtime. And I looked back to where I was as a 20-year-old and the adventures of being a new Christian. And now it's 40-plus-year-old. And I'm so thankful for the refiner's fires that God gives me. He is able to sanctify far more through the daily grind than those momentary mountaintops. Mm -hmm. And I just thank him 